This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Surfshark is the VPN that I use mostly through its really handy browser extension on Chrome. With a few simple clicks you can change your IP and access foreign sites and media that you would usually not have access to. Or to just hide your IP from any sites or persons that may be trying to track you. No logs are kept, there's an app version that works with a whole host of different platforms and there's a 30 day money back guarantee if you are not satisfied. Newly added is an antivirus feature that scans for malware and provides real-time protection as you browse the internet. Go to surfshark.deal crowd and use the code crowd to get 83% off a two-year plan plus three extra months plus antivirus for free. That's surfshark.deal slash crowd or click the link in the description below. Thank you again to the folks over at Surfshark for sponsoring this video. There is this story you probably heard if you were an English school kid, of the English barons ruled by the incompetent King John who forced the king into signing the Magna Carta. And this document, a concession by the king to the rights of the barons, supposedly formed the foundation from which English democracy and Anglo-American democracy in general was born. The Magna Carta holds an almost mythical and sacred position within the English-speaking political consciousness. The supposed foundation from which English liberty was unleashed upon the world and Britain came to prosper. There is, however, a problem with this narrative. Seven years after the signing of the Magna Carta in 1222, King Andras II of Hungary was forced to sign the Golden Bull. The Golden Bull is sometimes called the Magna Carta of Eastern Europe, but it was far more extensive in the rights and privileges that it entitled the Hungarian aristocracy to. Hungary and England basically had the same starting position in political development. But in the coming centuries, there was no Hungarian democracy and no ideal of Hungarian liberty that evolved from the Golden Bull. Instead, the Kingdom of Hungary decayed, lost power and influence and was eventually conquered by the Ottomans. Some may blame this decay on the Mongol invasion, but this conveniently ignores the less famous second Mongol invasion in which the Hungarians decisively defeated the Mongols and kicked them out of Hungary. No, the reason for the decline of the Hungarian kingdom actually is the Golden Bull. The Hungarians were a nomadic people originating from the southern Urals, near the modern Russian-Kazakhstani border. Seven Hungarian tribes invaded Europe in the 9th century, conquered the Pannonian Basin and used it as a base from which they spent the next 100 years invading, plundering and raiding the Balkans, Greece, Germany, Italy, France and even as far as Spain. The century known as the Hungarian invasions and what the Germans call Ungarn Kriege didn't end until the Holy Roman Empire defeated the Hungarian war hordes at the Battle of Lechfeld in 955, kicking the Hungarians out of the Holy Roman Empire and confining them to a sphere of influence that contained half of the Balkans. By the 10th century, the most powerful of the seven Hungarian tribes, the Megyeri, founded the Arpad dynasty converted to Christianity and turned the sphere of influence in the Balkans into the Kingdom of Hungary. Just as in most of Europe, warlords became aristocrats and kings, ruling over peasantry in a decentralized system of feudalism. Just like in the rest of Europe, communal lands became the property of the king, who then handed them out to aristocrats, forming the foundation of a power struggle between the king and the aristocracy. With the aristocracy gaining more estates and power, both the Hungarian and English kings were forced to sign concessions into two constitutional documents. There is however a key difference between the two. In England, the barons wished to extend their privileges and therefore forced the Magna Carta. In contrast, in Hungary, it was the royal army and the church who forced the Golden Bull to protect themselves from the barons. The Hungarian king had already been so weakened by the power the aristocracy had gained through the acquisition of estates that the army feared its own position of power. And the church in Hungary feared that the aristocracy would come for its estates and also wanted to drive out the Jews and Muslims that many Hungarian aristocrats tolerated in their lands. The fact that there were 30 Muslim villages in 12th century Hungary as well as large Jewish communities who were not only tolerated while the rest of Europe was consumed by religious zealotry and intolerance but also protected when foreign crusaders marched through Hungary on their way to Jerusalem shows just how decentralized political structures were at the time and just how powerful the regional Hungarian aristocrats were. 
The Hungarian state was even further weakened by the first Mongol invasion, which destroyed the army and occupied the country. Lucky for Hungary, the Mongols left after only a few years because the Great Khan died. So they had to return to the steppes to pay tribute and elect a new Great Khan. Out of fear of a Mongol return, the Hungarians rebuilt an army, an army that successfully defeated the Mongols. However, that army was never incorporated into the state. It remained completely loyal to the Hungarian aristocracy. The centralized Hungarian state was thereby completely weakened. The Hungarian aristocracy had no military or state obligations of service towards the king. An early parliament created by the aristocracy had so much power that the Hungarian king basically became little less than a powerless figurehead. The Hungarian aristocratic assembly even gave themselves the power to imprison the king for the welfare of the kingdom should he threaten such. Although Hungary was a centralized kingdom in name, it was basically reduced to little more than a confederacy of oligarchic barons by the 14th century. Then came the Turks. With the advancing of the Ottomans into the Balkans during the 15th century, the Hungarian state briefly rebounded. Janos Hulyandi, an aristocratic military leader, was made regent of the state, raised taxes and formed what became known as the Black Army, which inflicted several defeats on the Ottomans, even kicking them out of Serbia at one point. The Hungarian Black Army managed to protect Hungary and for 50 years was basically the only thing stopping the Ottomans from just rolling into Europe fascinating topic. However, there are military history YouTubers who can probably cover this better. For us, what matters is that for all of its successes, rather than cementing the necessity of a centralized state, the Hungarian aristocracy resented and hated the Black Army. They hated its successes, they hated its commander, they hated the fact that they had to pay taxes for it, and they resented that they had to give up their own military privileges. They hated the centralized government structures needed to sustain it. So, by 1490, they called a parliament and voted to reinstate their own military privileges. They cut the funds and provisions of the Black Army, placed the puppet boy king on the throne, and to add a cherry on top, they cut the taxes levied on them by 80%. Four years later, the Ottomans invaded Hungary, crushed what was left of the Black Army, killed the boy king, and conquered all of Hungary. The Hungarian aristocratic oligarchy basically destroyed their own country for a tax cut. Whig history is the idea that liberal democracy is the almost natural result of the progression of specific historical developments throughout history. It's an idea originating in England and basically claims that liberty is a concept invented by the Greeks, inherited to Rome, continued in spirit in Anglo-Saxon Britain, reinvigorated by the Magna Carta, re-examined by Cromwell, and ultimately triumphantly reborn through the Glorious Revolution, culminating in the Enlightenment and American Revolution. I'm admittedly paraphrasing this summary in a rather uncharitable way because I find the idea ridiculous. But as ridiculous as I may make it sound, I would not be surprised if you have encountered it yourself. The idea that liberal democracy or liberalism is unavoidable, a human force of desire for freedom so powerful it will eventually overcome all odds to establish itself. That there is a specific set of political developments and stages societies undergo to achieve a liberal democratic framework. You may have even heard in particular British conservatives argue such by listing events such as the Magna Carta and Glorious Revolution as proof of a natural path to liberty. It's a seductive idea, very similar to great man history, and rebranded into a sort of great ideas history. But it is ultimately wrong. On this channel, I have critiqued Marxist and nationalist narratives of history, but I have also often criticized this, namely every time you see the smug Britain ball claiming to be the foundation of democracy. I find this to be one of the greatest flaws of liberal narratives of history, and I say this as a liberal myself. The seductive tendency to craft a narrative of freedom that places events, almost like Marx did with social classes, as necessary components in a development to liberal democracy. Because just as with Marxism, the historical record simply proves this wrong. Medieval Hungary and England both had the same political starting positions of decentralized, constitutionally limited power. But they both went entirely different directions. The English king managed to retain enough power to build a semi-centralized state, resulting in a political struggle over compromise in power between monarchy and aristocracy. The Hungarian king lost his powers to an aristocracy that drove the kingdom off the cliff. 
There are more examples than merely this one as well. In 1573, while Europe was swamped in religious intolerance and wars, the Warsaw Confederation was signed in Poland. A constitution that besides limiting the power of the king and empowering the aristocracy, also made the king an elected office and granted unparalleled religious freedoms to those residing within the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Historians have pointed out the similarities between the Warsaw Confederation and the American Constitution. In many ways, in particular in terms of religious freedoms, the Warsaw Declaration was almost a century ahead of its time. But similar to Hungary, what happened was that the Polish aristocracy used their privileges to empower themselves at the expense of everyone else and weakened the central state. The Polish king became a puppet of the Polish aristocracy and the aristocracy became corruptible to foreign influences which helped amplify the collapse of Poland into foreign rule. The mistake made by Whig history is to view political developments from an entirely idealistic lens. The Hungarian aristocracy did not try to limit the power of the king for the humanistic benefit of all the subjects of the king, or because some ancient liberalism before liberalism. Neither did the English aristocracy either. They were not the forerunners of a humanist struggle for freedom. They merely wanted the freedom to exploit the peasantry without interference or taxation by the king. Institutions are inherently conservative. Once established, those who establish them or work within them have an invested interest in preserving the continuation of said institution, even if such can come to the detriment of others. The preservation of such an institution is more often than not not motivated out of a genuine belief in the wider benefit of said institution, but to preserve the structures that benefit those controlling the institution. An example of this is the rise and fall of the Republic of Venice and the Venetian trade empire. Venice was a proto-republic. It gained its independence in 810, right at the time that Europe started to lurch out of the Dark Ages and trade became more viable and lucrative again as a result. Being situated around islands in the middle of the Mediterranean, the Venetians were as a seafaring people put in an almost ideal position to conduct trade across the ocean. By the 14th century, Venice had grown to a population of 100,000, one of the largest cities in Europe, if not even the largest, the capital of all European trade. The rise to this prominent position was spectacular and built upon innovations in commerce, specifically the Comenda. The Comenda was a contractual trade agreement that was signed between two people. The wealthier partner provided the capital and the other would travel with the capital to get the merchandise to assure the success of the trade. The profits of these ventures were then split between the two contract partners. In some ways, this was an early form of stock investment, and in Venice it became the primary means of social mobility. While the rest of Europe was spending its time in feudalism with strictly enforced and unmovable social roles, any Venetian could sign such an agreement to then acquire capital through trade. In all medieval city-states, it was the wealthy merchants who ruled the cities. These usually governed through elected early parliaments, into which the merchants elected representatives too. And what makes Venice so unique is that we see through the documentation of those representatives that more and more wealthy families of merchants continue to be established throughout the centuries. Basically, the open and inclusive economy created a social mobility that didn't exist anywhere else in Europe. Parallel to this, the political institutions of Venice were further expanded through the creation of a council of merchant representatives meant to limit the power of the elected ruler of the city, who was called the Doge, another ministerial council of magistrate representatives, and a council of aristocrats who picked and nominated candidates for the office of Doge. This furthered the creation of additional political development through the creation of magistrates, bankruptcy laws, appellant courts, and the legally binding private contract. The private contract, in many ways, is a Venetian invention. These political innovations, in return, were the foundation for yet another economic innovation – banking. At the height of its power in the 14th century, Venice was a city-state with both inclusive economic and political institutions. From here on, Venice began to decline. And a key factor in that decline was the economic process of creative destruction. The social mobility guaranteed through commercial activity meant that the political and economic power of ruling families declined through the emergence of new families, competition in a market economy. Starting in the late 1200s, political tensions started to emerge. Established city elites no longer wanted to share power with or accept upcoming new wealthy Venetian families. They disliked the competition. So, they expanded their powers of their own councils and introduced a police force to crack down on political dissent. 
By the early 1300s, political inclusivity had been stamped out, and with political power now closed within a limited and non-inclusive elite, these newly established Venetian oligarchs banned the commander. The mechanisms of economic inclusivity were thereby destroyed. In the following decades, the Venetian oligarchy nationalized the trading companies of Venice, effectively seizing complete control of them for themselves. Shipping goods was now only possible through the merchant fleets owned by the Venice oligarchs, with high taxes leveled on all outside of the oligarchy who wished to participate. From here onward, Venice declined in power, wealth and population. Throughout the coming centuries, while the populations of other European cities expanded, Venice was the only one that had a declining population. Stagnation and decay took hold and Venice was reduced to little more than a plaything of other European powers. The established wealthy and powerful families of Venice didn't wish to share the institutions of wealth and power with up-and-coming families who used mechanisms of social and economic mobility to gain wealth and power. So. They destroyed the mechanisms of social and economic mobility to preserve their own institutions of power. However, thereby dooming Venice to stagnation, lack of innovation, decline and eventually subjugation and conquest by foreign powers. What many advocates of Whig history often forget is that the people many consider to be the founding fathers of liberalism were keenly aware of the danger presented by the institution of free commerce to generate oligarchic structures that consequently undermined those very institutions. John Locke, for example, demanded that there should be a maximum income, that the unbridled hoarding of wealth represented a danger to the commonwealth and that therefore, at a certain point of high income, the commonwealth ought to step in and cap and take the earnings of an individual that are deemed too much to be necessary for living and business. In 1778, the American founding father John Adams warned, the aristocracy is always more sagacious than an assembly of the people collectively, or by representation, and sooner or later proves an overmatch in policy. It is always more cunning too than a first magistrate, and always makes of him a mere ceremony, unless he makes an alliance with the people to support him against it. What is the whole history of wars in Europe but one demonstration of this truth? The standing armies of Europe were all given to kings by the people to defend them against aristocracies. Adams is a founding father who is widely associated with elitism and centralized federal government, together with Madison, who wrote in the federal papers, It is of great importance in a republic not only to guard society against the oppression of its rulers, but to guard one part of society against the injustice of the other part. Different interests necessarily exist in different classes of citizen. In a society under the forms of which the stronger faction can readily unite and oppress the weaker, anarchy may as truly be said to reign as in a state of nature, where the weaker individual is not secured against the violence of the stronger. Both Adams and James Madison were known to have been in conflict with Jefferson, who envisioned the United States to become a society of autonomous and independent small business owners, craftsmen, artisans and traders and farmers like himself, who ran and regulated the economy by themselves for themselves. Jefferson's vision won when he beat John Adams in the presidential election of 1800, but Jefferson's dream was killed during the American industrialization of the 1860s to 1920s. That time period is today often romantically misrepresented by American libertarians as the American Golden Age. While it is true that it was a golden age of business in America, it was also the golden age of American corruption and business criminality. Unrestrained by economic regulation, what began to emerge in the 1870s were increasingly powerful corporations that increasingly monopolized their markets and strangled competition. One of the earliest examples of such is a group of men called the Associates who founded the Pacific Railroad Company. They sold stock for a company that didn't even exist, used that money to get Leland Stanford elected governor of California, thereby guaranteeing that the California government would give preferential treatment to their company, and then just flat out bribed members of the US Congress into giving them access to 9 million acres of land to build the Pacific stretch of the Transcontinental Railroad. None of these people had any experience in building railroads, three of them were just failed miners and failed businessmen businessmen. A physical company in terms of laborers and a supply chain for the materials needed didn't even exist. 
Yet, the US government gave them $100 million, agreed to give them $16,000 per mile of railroad built on flat land, $32,000 per mile on hills, and $48,000 per mile over mountains. They then bribed the government land surveyor to write a report concluding that the lands around Sacramento, which are literally called the Flatlands, was nothing but hills and mountains, and started building their railroad there. The entire thing was a scam. The railroads were built snaking around in weird paths to make sure that as much money as possible came their way for every mile the Congress paid for. They went to the various towns on the route to make them compete in who could offer the largest bribe, or else the railroad would not go through their town. They bought up the coal mines that supplied them, but hid that in shell companies and created a scheme where they mined coal for $2 a ton, then sold it back to themselves for $6 a ton and used the government's contract to reinvest them the remaining $4 per ton. By the time they met the Union Pacific Company route, both companies deliberately built tracks avoiding each other side by side so they could squeeze more money out of the Congress, until Congress noticed and forced them to meet and connect tracks. Once finished, the railroad executives abused their economic power, holding a monopoly over railroad transport out of the West. They hiked transport costs and fees for any goods leaving places like Arizona, Wyoming, Utah or Nevada, unless the goods belonged to companies they owned or had partnerships with, making the entire region economically dependent upon their goodwill. For decades throughout the Western states, you couldn't be elected governor or a congressman or even just run a successful business exporting any goods if you were not on good terms with or in the pocket of or had been bribed by the railroad executives. And this, in case you're wondering, is one of the main reasons why places like Arizona were economically underdeveloped and in some parts impoverished way up into the 1950s. None of the men known as the associates had innovated or invented anything. None of them had any experience successfully running a business. In fact, most of them were failed businessmen. By any modern standards, frankly, they were con men. But these men, who made their fortunes in the 1860s, would become a more common occurrence in the United States in the decades to come, be it in oil, steel, or banking, or tobacco. The by and large almost completely unregulated market of the 19th century United States produced a set of ruthless businessmen who amassed an incredible amount of wealth and used that wealth to undermine the market for competitors and gain political power. The common term used in that time for these men was robber baron. Cornelius Vanderbilt, who monopolized railroad and steamship transportation throughout the U.S. East and openly bragged that his economic power translated into substantial political power. John D. Rockefeller, who ruthlessly eliminated any competition to his oil businesses and managed to gain control over 88% of the United States oil industry. John Pierpoint Morgan, the founder of the banking conglomerate J.P. Morgan, who monopolized the U.S. steel industry together with Andrew Carnegie. Henry H. Rogers, an employee of Rockefeller who founded Anaconda Copper and monopolized copper mining. Or John C. Osgood, who sold his coal mining corporation to Rockefeller and is notorious for having pressured the Colorado government into sending the National Guard against striking miners and pressuring state legislators to criminalize strikes. By the 1890s, 70% of the US economy was owned by just a handful of corporations, owned by just a handful of very rich men who became the world's first billionaires. By all standards, this is what is called an oligarchy. For some legal and public relations crafty work, their corporations became known as trusts. Yet, the year 1890 is also when the golden age of the robber barons started coming to an end, with the passing of the Sherman Antitrust Act that prohibited the forming of business cartels that undermined competition. The following decades saw the four antitrust presidents, movements such as the Farmers' Antitrust Movement and Progressive Movement, and journalists like Ida Tarbell who ended that era. Roosevelt used the Sherman Act to break up the interests of J.P. Morgan and bring suits against the American Tobacco Company and Rockefeller Standard Oil. His successor, William Taft, broke up Standard Oil and introduced the federal income tax. Wilson passed the Clayton Act and created the Federal Trade Commission with the stated purpose of preventing the establishment of monopolies. He in fact warned, If monopoly exists, monopoly will always sit at the helm of government. I do not expect monopoly to restrain itself. And Franklin Roosevelt further strengthened the antitrust laws and introduced financial regulation to contain the buildup of monopolies. 
Farmers' movements, such as the one known as the Grangers, started winning elections throughout the Midwest in protest against exploitative business practices and tariffs set on interstate commerce by the various transportation monopolies. The biggest achievement came in 1887 with the Interstate Commerce Act, which is basically the starting point of where federal government regulation of US commerce began. While journalists such as Edith Tarbell published investigative pieces, like the famous The History of the Standard Oil Company, which helped turn public opinion against the trusts. In contrast to our times, in which giant corporations are seen as too big to fail, the prevailing attitude from the 1890s to the 1930s was that corporations could become too big to be allowed to exist. Civil society regarded them as a threat to economic and also to civil liberties and therefore threw their weight behind legislation to limit their growth and power. There are two main points I would like you to consider and discuss from this video. First, Whig history's bunk. The idea that there is a natural path or progression of humanity or a specific peoples into liberal democracy or liberty is simply not true. As we have seen with the examples of Hungary and Venice, Political structures that grant liberties can just as well be hijacked by forces that will abuse these powers to undermine those liberties for others. As tempting as it may be to see the history of humanity as a process of political progression, this is simply not the case. Liberties are far more fragile than many may first assume, and a society does not naturally progress into liberty through fulfilling certain stages in political development. Second, economic liberty is no guarantor of political liberty. As we saw in the example of Venice, where social mobility and political rights of participation were deeply tied to economic status and wealth, monopolies can still be formed to undermine what is seen as competition, both in economy and political. The example of the 19th century United States clearly outlines how unrestrained markets can create economic power structures that not only threaten economic liberty, but civil liberties. In a time in which open markets to countries like China and Saudi Arabia have failed to produce any substantial civil liberties in those places, and when the world's largest businesses are considered to be too big to fail, it may be worth remembering that the United States underwent a period in its political development of breaking up monopoly to guarantee market freedom and civil liberties. At the end of this video, I wanted to thank you especially the patrons and channel members, for your patience. Two months ago, I had an accident with a deep fryer that left me with some rather big oil burns covering much of my right arm and my chest. The injuries left me in a position where I couldn't work for more than a month and is the reason why most of the artwork in this video was not drawn by me. I am very grateful to the artists I hired for drawing 90% of this video while I was recovering. And just as my burns finally started to heal, I caught a really nasty case of COVID and also had to deal with some unfortunate private issues. In total, I must have lost around two months worth of work time. And I'm very grateful to all of you for not losing your patience with me and giving me the time to get through this mess while I couldn't work on a video. I'm hoping to get right back into the normal schedule of work and to bring a new video for you very soon. And finally, I wanted to give a special shout out and thank you to the Korean artist Teabag. Teabag has been one of the best artists I have hired for more than a year to draw art for many of my videos. He has not just been a great artist, but also a great teacher, giving me tips on how to draw and become a better artist myself. You probably noticed how my art style increasingly started to imitate his over the course of the videos I made. Teabag received a letter from the Korean government recently informing him that he was going to get drafted into the Korean military to do his two years of mandatory service. As such, I have to say goodbye and thank you. When you come back in two years and want to do some drawing work again, we will be open for you and waiting for you. And yes, that's a we, not just me, because it's not just me saying thank you and wishing you all the best, but everyone in our small little group of creators and friends that formed over the last two years. Hey G-Bag, I just wanted to say a few things um, before you do go into the military. And I just want to wish you all the best. You've been a great friend for the past 18 months or so since I've known you. And I know it's probably going to be tough for you. Um, and I just want to let you know that a lot of us are going to miss you in this period. But we are certainly looking forward to speaking to you once you're finally out of service on the other side. Take care T-Bag. I'm sure you'll be fine. And I can't wait to speak to you again one day my friend.
Thank you for all your hard work, and I wish you all the best. Hey, Teabag, it's me, Flying Tongue. Um, I, I have known that you're going to go to the military service for a while, and I wanted to wish you a passable time or possibly a good time there. I hope you... I hope nothing changes in the status quo and good luck and I hope it's not too tough. Um, hello, Teabag. This is Mrs. Human Carr speaking. And I just want to let you know, since I haven't spoken to you in a very long time, is that you have some very artistic, well-designed, unique balls. Your balls, they uh, stand out from the rest. Your balls, they are immediately noticeable to be your balls. If I were to rate them from 1 to 10, I would give a hundred for two double digits of zero or double digits <laughs> represent your balls. But anyway, <laughs> for real though, um, I'm sure people are gonna miss you a lot and the fact that Crowd is doing this for you is just shows you how much he appreciates you and the fact that you've contributed so much to his videos. The thing that I admire the most about you um, as an artist is that you are incredibly driven and I hope that you take pride in that and I hope that when you're in the army you're allowed to express your creativity because man you're you're super skilled and you're so talented and I, I wish you all the best. So good luck man. See ya. Auf Wiedersehen. Thank you for letting me um, say this crap. Hey Teabag, how are you? I hope you're fine. And I just wanted to say thank you for everything you have done, both working with Kraut and on a private basis, I guess you could say. And I just wanted to say good luck in the Korean army, man. And I will be hoping for your safe return from the army. Teabag, I'll miss your daily cat memes and Twitter rants. I'll miss your imaginative phrases. I'll miss your artwork. But most of all, I'll miss you. Please stay safe in the military and remember all of my advice. Now hurry back so we can start a new movie list together. <laughs>